Okay, let me try and head straight here. Okay, so we've stabbed in the entire design, which we previously discussed. Um, you can see we demonstrated stabbing in this bit here. Um, but we've also stabbed in the rest of the carving that's on the, the rifle. The box lid has carving and that design has been stabbed in or outlined. So basically we've created a cut around the perimeter of the design. Um, after we did that we started relieving the background because this is relief carving where the carving stands above the, the, the background. So I've been working on that for quite some time and I can show you what it's beginning to look like. So you can see this side has been relieved and we're beginning to, to get somewhere. It's a, it takes a lot of time to relieve the background and make it nice and smooth and, and uh, free from chips and swales and things like that. And so that's what we'll be talking about right now. So I'll just basically demonstrate a little bit first. Before I go too far, it might not be a bad idea to talk just a moment about the setup for carving. This is the stalks being held in a vise, and this vise happens to be adjustable for the height. Um, I find if it's a little higher when carving, I don't have to bend over as much. My back was getting sore, so I raised this up a little bit. Um, having a prop. This little prop here that supports the rifle is a good thing too. So that allows you to hold it in one spot in the vise and the other spot to be supported. Um, and of course we talked about the, the articulating arm light, which is very, very important for the, the carving process. So, um, so with that said, let's, let's get to removing a little bit of background. There are different ways to remove background. Probably the simplest is just to use a, a flat chisel. This is about a half inch wide flat chisel. Now you'll of course pick different, using this technique you'd pick different widths that will fit in the particular areas that you want to uh, remove wood from. In this case I'll be working in this big open area so I'll just use a half inch, this about half inch wide chisel. So one thing that's really important with carving is to watch the grain direction. And it's hard to describe if you're not familiar with it, but there's generally going to be one direction where the wood will cut well um, relative to the grain direction. If you try to cut it in another direction, it'll tear and pull out. So you have to be very mindful of that. Um, it's a constant battle. This walnut has been carving pretty well in a lot of areas, although some areas it's been um, very unforgiving of cutting against the grain at all. Sometimes you're occasionally forced to, to cut against the grain just based on the carving design. and if you have to, you have to use a very, very sharp tool, um, and this this hasn't been very, very uh, tolerant of that. Um, so, okay, we'll get back to some more carving. I'm going to come down the wrist here a little more. And the idea with this is to remove the background and keep it as smooth. And level as we can. You notice I'm also using a bit of a shearing cut. I don't always do that, but sometimes I do. It's just a little safer, the shearing cut. By shearing, I mean I'm kind of holding it at an angle relative to the direction I'm, I'm cutting. When you come up against <laughs> When you come up against features, you have to be a little careful that you don't just kind of go into the feature. So as I'm carving, I'm kind of pushing back with my other hand too in some ways. I 
as I get a little closer to this carving at the comb, I could just use a flat, but it's there's a little dot to carve around and it could be a little bit tricky. So I'm going to switch to a different tool and that is just a skew chisel. So a skew chisel, you can see the shape of it, it just looks sort of like a knife. This happens to be a double bevel skew chisel. So it'll help me uh, get in the closer areas and I'll show you how I use it. So. Okay, so this is the particular area that, that we're questioning, so if I can use it. I'm using my off thumb as sort of a stop or a little bit of a break so that it doesn't go too far. Now I will point out one other tool that I have that I forgot to mention is using an optivizer. So for careful carving, an optivizer is a good thing, and this of course depends on your eyesight. My eyesight's not as good as it used to be, so I use it a lot more. So I'm going to put the optimizer down and get to work in here. So I'm pushing with my off thumb to control it. The so carving does take quite a bit of hand strength. So we're getting around that little dot and defining the cone. A little pointy up top. And you can also use the skew chisel in the bigger areas too, which works pretty well. Come around here a little more. So, so what I'm really trying to do is read the surface and read it for shape and high spots, all while trying to maintain a, a smooth cut surface. Okay, so we're getting a little little better. Now I'm going to go ahead and use a skew chisel down through here. I'll be able to kind of pull down here and should be able to do okay with it. When I'm working up against a feature, you don't, ideally, you don't want the tip of the tool to, to cut into the, the feature. That'll just damage your edge. And I'm not, one thing I'm not doing is I'm not going along the, the design and trying to cut some sort of a groove or channel. I think that's kind of a bad procedure. I know some people have promoted that in the past, but I don't think that a, a V along the design is a good thing. I try to usually work the whole area down more at once, which is a, a real good point to make. Don't try to work in one particular area because then, then if you work in one area you dig a hole and you can't make smooth clean cuts in a hole and it sounds like a kind of a simple thing to say but you know as I've been I've taught classes over the years it's a real important concept I'm gonna keep coming along here As far as the height of the carving goes, it 
it very can vary a lot. Um, it's hard to put an exact number. It can go from basically nothing in a particular area of the design or design to you know it could be an eighth of an inch you need height in some areas. That would be unusual. I think the the idea of, of really low carving has been overblown. It's a sort of a simplistic view of the the long rifle and how the long rifle is carved in the original designs of the long rifle. And to put a number on like a particular uh, style of carving and the height of it, 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 within a gun it can even vary a great deal. An example of the of, the, of that on a small scale is this particular the area of the carving. I'll probably go a little deeper where it's cut in a little for excuse me a little further. So that area might be a little deeper there. I'm probably going to go back to the flat chisel here in a second. Work this area out pretty good. And a lot of it is just taste as well. Carving does take quite a while. It's not a fast process. Okay. So let's go ahead and move back to the flat chisel. And we'll work down the wrist a little more here if I can find it. There it is. And I'm going to start just pulling down the wrist a little bit. Getting rid of some of this. Walnut's kind of neat in that when you hold handle it, it gets the darker color and you make a fresh cut. You can really see the cuts. Okay, now I feel my, my tool right here. It's starting to want to dig a little bit or grab a little bit. So I have to be start to be a little careful. Like right in here, it's not wanting to not wanting to the cut. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna try to flip the tool over. You have a bit of a fulcrum when you use a tool like this. We'll try to run it like this and see how it cuts. That's doing okay. And again, I'm using back pressure at the same time as I'm pushing with my right hand. I'm kind of pushing back with my left hand. You don't want to chip the, the design. Okay, and as I get up to this corner, I'll probably switch back to this, the skew chisel. It'll let me get in there a little bit easier. The way I've been using that skew chisel, the way I've been demonstrating it, it's basically being used very similar to a knife. Although you, I do sometimes use it in other ways as well. Okay. So we're, we're making some progress. It's still probably... With the carving I want to do, it's a tiny bit on the low side and to get it to match the other side, but it's a, a start. So I'm going to go back to the skew chisel. Start working up into this corner. One advantage of the skew chisel, it comes to a point. And it's really versatile. You can get into a lot of different areas. It's actually, this tool is a tool that I use more than any other tool when I'm carving. And then sort of looking for high spots and starting to pare those down a little bit. You want cuts to be clean. You want to 
has to be sliced. You don't want split wood, you don't want torn wood, and you don't want the corners of your tools to dig in. There's nothing wrong with clean cuts in a carving background. Tool marks is what we refer to them as. What is bad is torn grain. By torn grain, it means that instead of a, a sliced cut, it's um, you know, a cut that is kind of broken, the wood is broken. And it shows up, it definitely shows up when the gun's finished. And you don't want the corners of tools digging in. Now just facets from, from a chisel is a really nice thing. Um, there's nothing wrong with it at all. Now the tendency is for those getting started, it's kind of, they might find the control of the tool to be hard or difficult. So there's a tendency to think that they can get the sandpaper out or little roofer files or something to, to make up for it. And it's, it's not really a great, great practice. On some big areas, big open areas like this, there's nothing wrong with using a file, like down the wrist. I probably will use a, a, a file, but in a lot of other areas you just can't get a file in and it's not reasonable and it's not a great practice to even get started with. It's better to learn to, to slice the wood off cleanly, be able to read the surface and be able to level the background out. One important part of that is your light. So I don't know if you can see on camera or not, but when I move my light, focusing right there, when I move my light, Okay, in that view, it shows the facets very cleanly. It shows the... Now, if I move this light here, just a tiny little bit, it doesn't hardly show it at all. So when I'm carving, I typically move the light all the time. because I want the carving to look as bad as I can while I'm carving it. That way I can identify which areas are going to be... need to be pared down to, to level the surface. So cross lighting with a directional light source is very important. Um, so I've actually dimmed the overhead lights a little bit. So I just have this articulating arm light. I use old incandescent bulbs. I use rough service. You can still buy them. I like them better than LED or, or any other ones. These just seem to be what I want and what I like. Okay, so we'll keep on doing a little more. We're going to continue this down here. Oftentimes what I'll do is I'll, I'll rough it out pretty decent and then I'll come back over it again to deepen it up a little bit if I need to, smooth it up, true up the surface. In this particular area it's a little hard to describe but it's better to work big areas too because with carving there's certain features that kind of limit your height or limit your depth and it's better to kind of work big areas down to those control points and then you can come back and adjust things. Okay, now I'm going to probably roll the stock in the vise here a little bit so I have a little bit better angle to get this last bit. I'm going to switch back to the flat. I've rotated the stock in the vise and switch back to the flat and try to try to pull it down. Now right here the carving is going to fade out right here so we have to be careful not go too deep or else if we go too deep it'll if we go too deep up in here it's not going to fade out to nothing here. So that's the idea is to make this fade out to, to nothing. So we don't want to really go any deeper than we're, we're basically at in this particular area. So I'm just rounding this around. So this is a good example where the depth is actually varying a little bit where it's going from nothing it's quite, quite high in other areas Cutting the background to carving is a not a quick process. You have to be very patient. And
and just keep at it and eventually it'll be done. A bunch of little tiny cuts is what you often end up with. Okay. Now an interesting thing is as I come around the wrist, it'll start to want to grab and dig in just because of the change in the direction. So at some point I'll probably have to start cutting from the butt forward here, but we'll see how we can do right here. So I'm gonna I'm going to reach around here and we'll keep on working the wrist down a little bit. Let's see if we can cut a bit more before it starts to grab. Okay, I'm going to use a skew chisel to get around this beaver tail, and it has this happens to have a little dot at the end of it, so I'm going to use it to get around that mess. Come on, Maybe my tools get starting to get a bit dull. So you, you do have to have sharp tools too and, and continually maintain them. They do get dull as you use them. Okay, making some progress. see if I can't come from the other direction now to define that beaver tail a little bit. It may cut here in this direction and it may not. And one clue if you're not sure about the grain direction, your cuts should be shiny. If your cuts are like kind of uh, you know, grayer in color I guess, that's a clue that you're cutting against against the grain. You don't want to cut against the grain. What it does is it actually pulls your chisel in or sucks your chisel or your cutting tool in and it's a bad bad thing. So we're still happy with the grain here which is a nice thing. I think I can actually go to that flat chisel again and get a little more of that material off. Let's give it a try. In this case, I'm using bevel down on the chisel. Now we have to be a little careful here that it's going to fade out basically to, to nothing at this point. So that's what I'm thinking about as I'm making this cut. It's one of those things where you ideally need to understand what you're trying to accomplish before you start cutting. Okay. So we're doing okay. This is going to need a little more height, but we're doing okay there. Let's go ahead and go back now, and we're going to start on a different area and then come back to this. The different area we're going to start on is relieving this, this toe molding here. This morning it goes along the, 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 the bottom of the stock. So, first thing I'm going to do is just drive this trigger guard pin down a little bit so, it, so we don't hit that with our chisel. That would be a, a bad thing. And we're going to go ahead and start cutting this. And when we cut this, it allows you to kind of bring everything together at once. And like I said, this does need to be deepened a little bit, but it, it's, it's, good, it's getting there. So, come back here and I'm going to put this prop back here where it's a little more stable. Turn the gun and the vise just a little bit. Okay. The first thing we're going to do is 
we're going to cut a little notch in the butt plate to allow us to get started with the with the cut. And this is just a file that I'm using to cut a little notch. This notch is angled a little bit right now. It's not parallel to the gun or the surface of the gun, but that's okay to start with. This is just a little bit of a starting point for us. Let's see what kind of height we're at. A little more. Okay, that'll do it for now. So. Now we can take a chisel. The fly is bugging me here. Flat chisel. And we can run along <clears throat> that line. So when you're using a chisel to run along this line, the thing you don't want to have happen is the corner of the chisel will start to dig into, into your line. Um, so as we're cutting, we want to try to pull away from the line. This side's always a little more difficult for me. The other side's a little more natural to work away from the line. I'm going to remove this box lid just to get it out of the way. And we're going to start cutting some of this wood away. So if you notice, I'm kind of pushing away from that line. Okay, I have a real long chisel that's sort of like I can keep running along rather because the handle is going to hit the the butt plate, but I can turn it over and get access to it too. We're just going to use this tool. I'm kind of messing up a little bit right there. Not that bad, but I have to watch because ideally I wanted to angle a little bit and this corner of this tool is just starting to nick there. And there's plenty to fade it in, but I, I should have had it angled just a little more like that. So we'll try to readjust. Okay, so that's roughly established. So we're going to come back and go over it again. I'm probably going to hit this with the chisel again to darn fly. It's starting to bug me. Another thing to talk about is your tools, you don't want them to bang against other tools. You don't want it to lay flat on the bench. Usually it's best to have a little prop to hold them up, something to, to, to hold the tools. You can see there's a little piece of brass that the fella gave me that had little notches in it to hold tools. Different ways to accomplish it, but you don't want them laying on a bench or bumping into each other. And <clears throat> one point to make is these tools if you work metal and wood, you're going to have metal chips on your bench. And these tools, when, when things are sharpened to a fine, keen edge, they develop a magnetism for some reason. I'm not exactly sure why, but they do. And your tool, if it's on the bench, it'll, it'll attract little bits of metal. So if you're not careful, you'll have little bits of metal, and then you end up using the, your tool, and those little bits of metal will damage the edge of your tool. So that's one good reason not to have your tools directly on the on the bench. So let me get this file again and now I can come in here and define this a little more. Lay it flatter. The 
refine this notch a little more. Now this gun is carved pretty heavily. It's just a style that I want to want to use on this gun. And by heavily, there's a lot of carving, quite a bit of carving, and it's and it's fairly deep and bold. Okay, that should be enough of a start, hopefully. Maybe a little deeper here. Keep running along again. Ooh, it's starting to get a little dull too. It doesn't want to stick and cut. So I'm just sort of fading it out a little bit. I think I will take a break and sharpen my tool here too. A good sharp tool, you'll feel it kind of stick. You won't have to force it into the cut. I'm having to use a little down pressure to, to get it into the cut right now. I think we'll take a break. I'll sharpen my tool. And then we'll come back and do some more. 